ECMO and conducted ECMO and many of you do not have any idea about how the ECMO is going. So let us start a scenario when we treat a patient of ARDS or a heart failure. Uh, for example, if you have a patient of severe ARDS who is severely hypoxemic and the patient is on ventilator and you put everything on the ventilator, you have started with a FiO2 of uh, 100% and uh, not able to maintain a plateau of less than 30. In spite of all the settings and all the high, higher setting of the ventilator, your patient is not improving and gradually become hypoxemic and hypercarpic. So this is the this is the classical situation where we can where we we think that the patient should go for the extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation. So uh, what I'm going to talk about the principles and the physiologic of extracorporeal life support. ECLS is the extracorporeal life support. What are the equipment and the indications, contraindications, initiation and monitoring and the weeding and complications. So I'll try to touch upon everything all and uh, <coughs> we'll try to explain the things which are there in ECMO. Now let us start with what is ECMO. This is the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO is a type of extracorporeal life support. Extracorporeal life support we say that when there is a, uh, 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 when we have a system which is outside the native circulation and which is supporting the heart and lung is called extracorporeal life support. This is, uh, this is used as a temporary support for the patient with respiratory and the cardiac failure. It augments the gas exchange in the cardiac output. As you know that uh, extracorporeal support here, we have a huge membrane oxygenator and pump, which, which actually improves the gas exchange in the cardiac output. <laughs> it is instituted in the management of life-threatening pulmonary mm -hmm. or the cardiac failure. This is very important. When we, when we think about the ECMO, we'll come uh, uh, in detail about when we should consider the ECMO in such situation, but the situation must be like this. Now, if you look at the picture, we can see how the uh, ECMO has, has got its evolution. And in this, we can see that uh, here, we can see the uh, uh, this is a bypass machine, which is, uh, was used uh, almost around 1930 by John Gibbon and all his wife uh, who started with in the operation theater. If you look at this machine, it was initial, and here the membrane was a bubble oxygenator. There is a difference between the bubble oxygenator and the membrane oxygenator. Bubble oxygenator is a large machine and it has a different type of activity which cannot be shifted out from the OT. So probably this is the first bypass machine which was used. And if you look at there, we can see that there is a transition from the bubble oxygenator going to the membrane oxygenator. Here, the oxygenation type is different, but still it is a very large and it's still that was even, uh, if this is time 1970s, where the membrane oxygenator started uh, in the practice in the operation theaters. And uh, uh, although it was not possible to transport this type of machine outside the operation theater, so there was a constant evolution and this is showing a recent ECMO. Uh, we can see that again, it is a pump and oxygenator and how the things has come in uh, uh, and how the things are evaluated from this larger complex machine to the simple form of the ECMO machine, which can be transported anywhere to the ICU and there's no need the patients to remain in the OT. So this is how we have uh, we have we have made a transition from the bubble oxygenator to membrane oxygenator and again if we are going further there are a lot of advancement even in the, every part of the ECMO. if you look at the uh, membrane oxygenator initially it was uh, a complex membrane but now it is a polymethylene uh, hollow fibers which is has got a very high biocompatibility and it is a very efficacious in exchanging the gas we have shifted from the roller pump to the centrifugal pump, which actually minimizes 
the uh, the hemolysis while you are uh, uh, doing an ECMO. And again, the least, most recent development is that we have moved from VA to VV ECMO, and also we are moving from a double lumen, uh, a double catheter to a double lumen single catheter, which can be used for the uh, in initiation and maintenance of the ECMO. So what we have seen that more and more development is occurring in the ex extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And that's why more and more it is coming in the practice and more and more it, it is becoming simpler to be used in the intensive care unit. Now, what is the principle of ECMO? And if you look at the basically the concept of ECMO is very simple. And what is happening, what we are doing in ECMO, this is the patient side, okay. So the patient side, the blood is removed uh, by uh, either by the gravity and, and associated with the pump, and this blood is coming from patient circulation to the extracorporeal circulation. This is the first step where the blood is drained. Now, from the pump, it is going to the oxygenator where there is CO2 is removed and oxygen is added by the membrane oxygenator. Then the oxygenated blood is going up, it is returned to the native circulation either in the venous form or in the arterial side. So it, the, if you want to conceptualize the ECMO physiology, it is simple. It is a drainage from the venous side, getting oxygenated and then again it is getting uh, returned either to the uh, venous side near the heart or in the arterial side. This is how the ECMO is basic principle when we are thinking about that. So when the, here you can think that when we talk about ECMO, when we think about ECMO, discuss about ECMO, we have to discuss about two circulations. One is the native circulation and another is the extracorporeal life support, that is the extracorporeal circulation. So there we have to discuss, we have to understand the combined native and the extracorporeal circulation. Now, if you, under, if you have understood that, then it is simple to understand that in a patient where there is only a respiratory support to do, and a patient is maintaining the cardiac output, then we can drain from one venous side. For example, we can drain the blood from the uh, femoral vein, the catheter is inside the inferior vena cava, and the, it can go in the circulation oxygenated and can be returned back to the again to the right atrium by either superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. If this type of uh, circulation where we are draining from the one vein and it is getting approxygenated, reperfused to the another vein near the heart, this is called venovenous circulation and this is venovenous ECMO and this is mainly used for the respiratory support where the patient is maintaining the cardiac output and patient is not in shock and the patient has got only problem with oxygen and typical example for this is acute severe ARDS with refractory hypoxemia which we say day by day in the Harvard hospital and we're difficult to ventilate the patient on uh, mechanical ventilation. Second example is the when we can see that here is again the excess cannula again in the venous side, it is getting oxygenated, but the return cannula where the oxygenated blood is uh, going, it is going into the femoral artery. So here, what we are doing is drainage from the venous side, getting oxygenated, and then it is going to the femoral arterial side. This type of support is called VA ECMO or the veno arterial ECMO. And it is different from the venovenous because here the perfusion cannula or, or here the uh, uh, this is return cannula is the artery. Here I want to explain the first letter always in ECMO suggests from the drainage. And the second letter suggests where the return is. Here you can say that the V, A, V, V. So it is venous drainage and venous return. Here it is the venous drainage arterial return. Okay, so uh, then we can also have VVA, uh, where venous drainage, venous drainage, and arterial return. So this type of things is used in the ECMO terminology. But basically here, a VA 
ECMO is used when uh, their patient has got a problem with the heart or the cardiac support, when the patient is in cardiogenic shock, or a patient has got a combined, whether the patient has got a combined means of cardiac and respiratory failure. Typically, those patients who has got a shock and pulmonary edema, they are not able to maintain the respiration, uh, oxygenation. These are patients of ARDS with myocardial depression. These patient is better to put on the venoarterial ECMO. Other indication for venoarterial ECMO is eCPR. For those patients who has got a cardiac arrest in the witness cardiac arrest in the casualty as a part of MI or VTVA, these patients if they are not improving with the uh, uh, with the with the conventional CPR, these patients can be put on the ECMO, and this is called eCPR. So, two important indications for VA ECMO is the cardiac support and eCPR, and important indication for venovenous ECMO is the respiratory support, particularly severe ARDS with the refractory hypoxemia. Now, if you have uh, if I here, I can I, 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 I will tell you uh, what are the some of the important equipment or devices which is used in the complex machine of the ECMO. We'll start from the uh, from we'll start from the circuit. So this is the most visible part. So as you can see that the, the circuit has got uh, one is the drainage circuit is typically bluish. And those who are reperfusing after oxygenation is slightly reddish uh, a circuit. So this is a deoxygenated blood getting in the oxygenator, oxygenated, and then it getting a reperfusion of patient oxygenated blood. So this is the circuit. This is the membrane oxygenator, and it is and then it is connected with the sweet gas flow. A blender is getting connected to the membrane oxygenator. Now here is the pump. We can see that the pump, the function of the pump is that it is creating a negative pressure on the native circulation of the patient side and then it is creating a positive pressure on the membrane oxygenator side. So it can drain the blood and it can help by increasing the pressure to reperfuse the blood on the venous side. Here you can see the hand crank. This is the for the emergency situation. If this pump has somehow is not working and there is a, some failure, pump failure, electricity failure, uh, the doctor, physician, perfusionist, or nurse is going to start a, a hand crank. So this is the safety measure given every ECMO machine. Here is the heater and cooler, which is help to maintain the normal thermia to the patient because. These circulations comes from the external part. They are very lightly and got a high risk for the hypothermia. So we can uh, maintain the temperature by applying the heater. So these are the major, major uh, uh, equipments which is used in present ECMO. Now coming to the individual part, if you look at here again, if you can see the membrane is here. This is a hollow fiber membrane polyethylene and which has got a uh, capacity for uh, this can, this can, uh, actually uh, oxygenate the blood from uh, uh, and the PO2 it can reach up to 500, 600, which is the normal function of the lung. So it can replace the complete normal function of the lung. And most of the most of the companies who are making this, they, they claim that it can work for one or two weeks. And we have seen that it can work even for uh, more than two weeks, but generally it works for two weeks, if not getting any complications. There are two systems. One is the pre-membrane pressure outlet where you can membrane the, measure the pre-membrane pressure, pressure and the post-membrane pressure, which is also, we'll come to know uh, later slides that what is the importance of pre-membrane and the post-membrane pressure. This is centrifugal pump. In initial days of ECMO, people used to have a roller pump. You must have seen a roller pump in the CRRT machine. So this is the pump which is used in the CRRT machine is a roller pump. So and here, this is the centrifugal pump and there are less complications with the centrifugal pump with that. This is a typical centrifugal pump, which is used in, this is we call it a rota flow drive. Again, hand crank that I've already explained to you. Now coming to, again, we'll try to summarize the things that how the things are there. This is a typical patient who is uh, in our ICU, is in a very venous ECMO. You see what is uh, what is attachment to the patient. This yellow 
uh, this is showing that the patient has got a right-sided femoral vein catheterization, which is a 22 French right catheter. So this is basically draining the blood. And it is to see the difference in the color of the blood. This is more bluish. So this is draining the blood. And this is getting uh, drained by the pump and going to here to the oxygenator. And after that, it is, this circulation is going into the internal jugular vein and superior vena cava, a right atrium. So this is the, uh, where the blood is uh, getting uh, uh, reperfused or blood is uh, uh, going to this circuit. And this is a pinkish blood after getting oxygenated going to the... So this is a typical circuit configuration in a patient who has got ARDS. And this was a patient actually of HO pneumonia. The patient has got a ventilator. This is the ECMO console where you can regulate the flow and other things. So this is how uh, 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 the circuit is organized in a venovenous uh, circulation or venovenous ECMO. This ventilation. Now coming to uh, something about the physiology of the ECMO. Uh, the ECMO physiology can be divided into these parts, the blood flow, the gas exchange, the oxygen delivery, the membrane function. The blood flow to the membrane or the extracorporeal oxygen is totally depends upon two things. One, how your pump is functioning and second, how your native heart is functioning. Native heart functioning will come first. It is very obvious that if your patient has got a shock and low cardiac output, the blood flow to the pump will be less. And if, if this is the situation, uh, then we have to put the patient on rear type of ECMO. Again, the pump is the important part that uh, 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 how much blood is going to the patient. Now, a pulsatile flow, usually ECMO flow is not pulsatile. It is a, it is a, it is a simple flow, it is not a pulsatile flow. So more and more uh, uh, pulsatile flow more and more you have a native heart function. The, so the pump, native heart function, and third is the cannula size important. If you have a larger cannula, you can have a better flow. If you have a better preload, then you have a better flow. Also, if you have a larger return cannula and less afterload, then you have a better flow. So you can see that the flow is determined by the pump by the native heart function, by the size of the cannula, and by the preload and afterload in the ECMO setting. Now coming to the membrane oxygenator, what are the factors which actually affects the oxygenation? The most important factor is FiO2. Higher the FiO2, which is supplied by the blender, better the oxygenation. Second is the SVO2, we mix venous oxygen saturation. We all know that the mixed venous oxygen saturation is a marker of the systemic perfusion or the systemic oxygen utilization. So if you have a higher mixed venous oxygen saturation, your post-membrane oxygen, oxygen will be high. If you have a lower mix, mixed venous oxygen saturation, your post-membrane uh, oxygen, oxygen will be low. Now the membrane capacity, every membrane has got a capacity. Usually it is uh, equivalent to the cardiac output and sometimes it is uh, double the cardiac output. Normal cardiac output in normal person is five liter. But as you know that a patient who entered in the ICU, a patient who has got a septic shock, a patient who has got a IRDS, many patients has high cardiac output. So the membrane has capacity to oxygenate even double the cardiac output. That means that 10 liter per minute can be, uh, can be actually getting oxygenated from the membrane. So the membrane capacity is also important. Red cell exposure is very important. Higher the hemoglobin, more and more chances of getting better oxygenation. And blood flow is also important factor, which actually affects higher the blood flow, more and more chance of oxygenation. So remember that a SVO2 high, better oxygenation, FiO2 better oxygenation, membrane capacity fixed. Every membrane has got a fixed capacity and beyond that they cannot oxygenate. Higher the hemoglobin, better oxygenation and blood flow. That's why in one of the principle of uh, maintaining the ECMO is that we try to keep hemoglobin uh, uh, which is around uh, 10 gram per DL, which is which is different from the normal practice of the ICU, where we try to keep around nine or eight even, will accept seven. But in ECMO patient, we have to keep around 10 so that we'll have a better oxygenation. 
Now, what determines the carbon dioxide removal? The most important factor which determines the carbon dioxide removal is the gas flow, sweep gas flow. Usually, when you start the ECMO, we keep the ratio one is to one. That means the gas flows is kept according to the blood flow. If you have a blood flow of four liter per minute, then we keep gas flow of four liter per minute. Sometimes we can increase ratio two is to one. That means the gas flow is eight liter and blood flow is four liter, depending upon how the patient is clearing the carbon dioxide. So the gas carbon dioxide clearance is relatively independent from the blood flow. Now, how do you monitor your membrane is efficient? Then we can see that the post membrane oxygen. We can check the patient post membrane uh, saturation of the patient. We can see how the CO2 is getting actually uh, uh, removed from the blood. That also indicates how efficient is the membrane. And there are factors which can affect the membrane and the most important is thrombosis and membrane pollution. You know that if anything which is getting extracorporeal, there is higher risk of thrombosis and clot formation. Sir, if the membrane sir, gets sir, to it, then there is sir, higher chance. So there is some static coming from your side in the audio. Just see if it's okay with your audio and all there. From static, all right. Take a minute, sir. Hmm. Okay. Uh, is it clear now? Uh, better, better now. So, create, 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 uh, uh, the, thrombi, uh, the thrombosis part of the information which is the important factor which is the membrane sir, function. Sound, sound. There's a problem. It's clear. 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 Okay. One more time. Let me try. Yeah. Uh, External mic attacker kick, but they could share this with the shoe. The students are there. Directly, both of us are adding to clear. Just speak directly to the thing. A party of art. A bit static are like a kid. A bullet, bullet. Hello. Are you some? Hello. Neither were clear. Neither was speech make static. Hello. It's not clear. Now, is it audible? Uh, problem is, sir, it is not clear. Uh, carry on for some time. Okay. So, uh, the membrane efficiency of monitoring is uh, uh, so the factors which determine the membrane efficiency is the post is the uh, 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 how we can determine the membrane efficiency is the post membrane oxygen and CO2 removal gradient. If you have a better CO2 removal and post membrane oxygenation is more than 500. With a FiO2 of 1, that means that your membrane is functioning well. There are certain factors which, uh, which uh, can help in, uh, which are actually produces the problem with the membrane is thrombosis and fibrin formation, and which leads to poor O2 and CO, uh, O2 oxygenation and CO2 removal. The condensation, because also we are pro providing the heater, so the condensation will also have. Uh, have a, a, a bad effect on the membrane. Now, what are the factors which determines the oxygen delivery? There are certain factors which determines the oxygen delivery, and these factors can be grouped either from the extra from the extra corporeal side, or it can be grouped from the native circulation. So, oxygenation by the artificial membrane, as we know, that it can it can affect the oxygen delivery. Blood flow through the circuit, blood flow through the native heart and circulation, and blood 
oxygen to the native lung these all factors can affect oxygen delivery now the third portion of the ecmo which is the very complex and which is the limiting factor for the ecmo for many people for many patient are the cannulation uh there are three ways we can access the major vessels in the ecmo one is the surgical uh, central cannulation then we can have a surgical peripheral cannulation the most commonly what we do in our icu setup or intensive care setup is percutaneous cannulation that means it is percutaneous can uh, cannulation is done in the intensive care unit either most of the time it is being done with the ultrasound guided now coming to the veno venous uh, ecmo the percutaneous uh, cannulation can have different configuration as i told you it can be a femoral femoral configuration but the most common is femoral jugular cannulation that means we are actually draining the blood from the uh, femoral side this catheter tip remains in the intravena cava and then we are reperfusing the oxygenated blood in the jugular vein internal jugular vein and with the catheter tip in the ra or superior vena cava most recently the people have started a single vessel approach using dual lumen ecmo cannula which is being used now in a rds patient you can see here that this is the avlon catheter which is a dual lumen cannula and uh, you can see it has got uh, uh, the uh, opening which here is coming the oxygenated blood which is getting directly towards the tricuspid valve and here is the draining from the ivc part and the svc part of the uh, venous side so it is it is a dual lumen cannula avlon catheter only thing is that if you are using a dual lumen cannula it is okay the patient will be comfortable less invasive but you need a fluoroscopy guidance or eco guidance to place the orifice of the reperfusion inside the uh, towards the tricuspid opening so it has to be done in the uh, 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 in the uh, in the cath lab that is the limiting factor for the dual lumen cannula and uh, we can see here the different configuration of the va in the previous slide we have seen the different conf configuration for the vv ecmo in the v ecmo the most important which is used in the operation theater or in the pediatric or neonatal cardiac surgery is the central cannulation where you can have a ca one catheter in the are where you are draining the blood and the other catheter is placed either in the pulmonary vein or in the aorta so oxygenated blood is going so this is a surgically placed catheter most of those who are going for a bypass surgery and then from bypass machine if they are getting shifted to the ecmo they have this type of configuration surgically placed we also have a which is being used in the icu is that we are draining from the uh, basically from the femoral vein or the inferior vena cava and the oxygenated blood is getting uh, to the femoral artery and uh, uh, here we can this is the most commonly used in the icu and if you are getting in the femoral artery because the size of femoral artery is small and there is a chance of thrombus formation so always you put a reperfusion cannula in the femoral artery to prevent the limb ischemia similarly you can even drain from the superior vena cava and can put in the axillary artery and this is being used when you have a patient one to patient my patient should be mobile so these are the different configuration for the va ecmo so we know the vv ecmo configuration we know the vv ecmo configuration and single lumen configuration now when to consider patient for the ecmo this is very important for the beginner and we should not land up in a situation where from the there's no way out to go so the first is that if the patient has got a failed gas exchange what is the meaning of failed gas exchange when we talk about failed gas exchange we are talking about a conventional ventilation who, which is not able to support the lung in spite of the maximum ventilatory support second is the pump failure 
in spite of high doses of vasopressors your patient's lactate is rising you are not able to achieve the map then you can think for pushing the patient in the ecmo again the third is cardiopulmonary resuscitation or ecpr in a patient who has got a witness arrest not recovering and got a correctable disease they can also be put on the ecmo the second part of the patient selection is that is the patient's pulmonary or the cardiac disease is life threatening when we call life threatening if you think that the patient has got a 80% chances of mortality in spite of the conventional treatment you can have you can say that your patient has got a life threatening disease second question you should ask whether the patient has got a reversible disease you will not put a patient on ecmo if the patient has got interstitial lung disease which lung fibrosis and no plan for transplant so this is completely irreversible problem similarly patient has got a severe dilated cardiomyopathy and we cannot go for patient for putting down the ecmo are there any disease are the other diseases related to prognosis again you have patient comorbid condition is very important is the ecmo more likely to have uh, to help or the heart patient it is important you see the coagulopathy you see the contraindications for placement of the ecmo this is also important and then you decide the type of configuration whether the patient should go for a va or should go for a vva this is very important to understand what are the contraindications so i have divided the contraindications absolute and related contraindications if the patient has got a progressive non uh, and there is no chance of recovery of cardiac disease patient is not a candidate for transplant either a heart or the lung transplant this is the contraindication then again the patient has got a progressive disease and irrespective of the transplant status this is also a contraindication patient has got a chronic severe pulmonary hypertension no plan for transplant again contraindication advanced malignancy graft versus old disease weight is more than 120 kg why i have kept it because it is very difficult to cannulate this type of patient and more chances that the patient will have a complications if the patient has got uncorrectable coagulopathy this type of patient also has got contract relative contraindications are high pressure ventilation with the high of fire to for more than 7 days in ards patients limited vascular access inability to accept the blood product there are certain uh, conditions where the patient is not in a condition to accept a blood products because ecmo is a situation where you use large amount of blood products for those patients any condition where there is organ dysfunction or multi organ dysfunction has set up these patients are also a contraindication and too specific for the va ecmo are severe aortic insufficiency and the aortic dissection why aortic dissection because this patient requires anticoagulation and aortic dissection is a contraindication for anticoagulation so these are the patient where we you, you actually uh, these are the relative contraindications to use a patient chart now what are the clinical goals this is when you are trying to put the patient on ecmo it is a complex type of treatment should so must have a goal the first thing and also the ecmo is not the treatment it is just buying time it is replacing uh, the circulation and the oxygenation so we could ask a question whether the patient when putting a bridge to recovery like a ids patient like myocarditis patient we think that the patient will improve in one week or two week and then we will able to remove the ecmo so acute reversible illness now the second is a uh, clinical goal in such such situation of ecmo is whether my patient is a candidate for transplant and at present he is not maintaining the organ function so i have to put the patient on ecmo like end stage lung disease patients with cardiorespiratory failure the third is bridge to bridge what is bridge to bridge like a patient who has got a heart failure and the patient is ultimately or eventually is going to have some type of ventricular assist device but meanwhile we have to support the circulation where we can put the patient on ecmo but be careful sometime we land up in that bridge to nowhere like a patient is on ecmo not improving has got multiple complications so you should also able to have whether uh, will able to clinically diagnose whether you have landed up in a bridge to nowhere but basically you should think bridge for the recovery for the transplant for bridge for the bridge 
Now, typically, when when you think the patient of ARDS should go on ECMO, if you look at the profile of ARDS patient, uh, usually initially they will have a hypoxemia. You put the patient on ventilator. The patient is not improving. You can say my patient has got a refractory hypoxemia where the PF ratio is less than 100. Despite six hours and the pH has gone to of ventilation less than 1.5, the patient's blood pressure is going more than 30 in spite of uh, all the uh, precaution taken care. So here you should start thinking that, okay, this is the patient who should be put on the extracorporeal life support. And uh, again, uh, if we are, we are here thinking and then uh, the next step your patient is going to land up is the difficult to ventilate with lung protection. Finally, the patient will might have hypercarbia in spite of supporting a good amount of minute ventilation, the patient will have a hypercarbia. So these, this is the situation or this is the profile of the patient of ARDS who actually requires ECMO and this is how the patient will progress if you not support the patient with ECMO. So eventually they will have a... So the failed gas exchange or the potential to fail gas exchange, not able to maintain the conventional ventilation is probably where you think to put the patient. What are the objective criteria? There are objective criteria. We can say the Morel score and the Morel score more than three, where you can see the PA ratio, the chest X-ray, the PEEP, and the compliance. And if it is more than three, your patient will have uh, the, there is a high chance the patient will not sustain on the conventional ventilation. You can think the patient will put on the ECMO. So uh, I'll escape this slide. Uh, so we'll talk to the, what are the indications for BA ECMO? So far you have discussed about the VB ECMO. What are the, uh, how, when you think the patient should be put on the VA ECMO? The most important is the cardiogenic shock with or without MI, and which is the, which is the also very common indications and the fulminant myocarditis, right heart failure. Most, uh, most uh, uh, common situation in intensive care unit is the acute where the patient can be put on ECMO while the definitive treatment for the pulmonary embolism is going on. Then CPR or the eCPR and the medication overdose, beta blocker poisoning, digital poisoning where the ECMO has used and bridge to decision to transplant or bad as already discussed. So these are the, uh, these are the etiological uh, entity where you can think to place the patient on ECMO. And the functional status, if the patient's cardiac index is less than two liter per, per minute per meter square, that is severely decreased uh, cardiac output. The patient's lactate is going more than five millimole. Uh, and the central venous oxygen saturation is also less than 65 or 60% in spite of all vasopressors and the cardiac support medicine. We can say that here is that we can think the patient to be placed on the uh, VA. So this is how you choose the patient to put on the VA. Now, once you have selected the patient to put on the ECMO, and once we have decided, we have done a cannulation, how we are going to initiate the ECMO. The typical setting in a patient who has, uh, who's, uh, 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 who's getting uh, ECMO treatment is the first thing is to decide the blood flow or the pump. See, the pump flow is determined by the RPM, that is the rotation per minute. The higher the RPM, higher the flow, if the other factors remain constant. And usually we keep the uh, pump flow uh, to achieve a blood flow of four to six liter per minute. And by, by increasing and controlling the speed by RPM, and uh, we start a uh, sweep flow, one is to one ratio. That means if you have a four liter of flow, then you should start a gas flow of one liter. And then you can see 100% FI2. So this is the three things which is very important. One is gradually achieve within half an hour to a flow of four to six liter and go with a FI2 of one and the sweep gas flow is one is to one ratio, you can increase. 
The second important thing is anticoagulation. It is not possible to support a ECMO without anticoagulation. High chance of thrombosis and high chance of clotting. Although the recent and the new circuits claims that they have anticoagulation coating, and the first three four days the chances of uh, clotting are less. More and more, you put the patient, prolong the patient on ECMO, there is high chance of anticoagulation. So. Atmospheric usually has anticoagulation lining. The load of the fibrin is usually administered to prevent the clot formation. In the first 24 hours, you should monitor the ACT. Actually, uh, we are monitoring the ACT uh, as ACT is the uh, activated clotting time, which is being used for monitoring the ECMO clotting, and it should be four hourly. Beyond 24 hours, we can do four times a day, or even you can decrease the BD. The target ACT should be around 140 to 160, and, and the target platelet should be more than 80,000. Okay. If per day, every day you should do APT or APTT also, and you should keep it uh, between 45 to 55 seconds. So this is how you monitor the anticoagulation, and usually the the uh, anticoagulation of choice is unfractionated heparin, which is used for the anticoagulation. Now, setting of mechanical ventilation. This is important, and in one uh, sentence, it should be ultra protective mechanical ventilation. And what, what defines ultra protective mechanical ventilation is that the tidal volume should be less than 4 ml per kg, body weight, plateau pressure 25, even you can go less than uh, uh, 20, the peep should be around 10 to 15 to keep the lung open. The FI2s uh, uh, in ventilator FI2 usually we keep less than 40% and the respiratory rate is more than 6 breath per minute. The patient easily tolerate this type of a uh, setting in initial stage of ECMO because initial stage of ECMO, the patient is usually sedated and paralyzed, so they do not have any air hunger. But once you try to stop the paralysis, you will might have to increase the respiratory rate uh, to uh, overcome the air hunger of this type of patient. But try to keep the ventilator setting as low as possible and when the patient is tolerating uh, 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 your uh, ventilator setting, you should keep the ventilator setting. Pump flow rate of the ECMO, BB ECMO should support the two-third of the cardiac output, usually around four to six liters, we can say. And uh, yeah, the target lowest saturation should be 85 to 90% and PAO2 should be 50 to 60. This is the target in VV ECMO. In V ECMO, the flow rate can be kept 2.1 to 2.4 liter per minute, uh, per meter squared. That means also it should be around 3 to 4 liter. Here, you should you should not decrease the flow uh, less than 2 liter. The problem is low flow is that lower the flow and higher the chances of clot formation. So in any case, in VA most the flow should not go less than one liter. And if you are keeping two liter or uh, 1.5 to two liter, it should not be more than four to six hours because chance of membrane thrombosis is there. The other setting is that pre-membrane pressure should be less than 300 mg. The transmembrane gradient should be 50, and the temperature should be uh, around 30. What is pre-membrane pressure? The pre-membrane pressure, we can say that yeah, there are three pressure points. If you look at the ECMO, the one is the uh, pre-pump pressure. Then you'll have a pre-membrane pressure, and then you'll have a post-membrane pressure. For you and for beginners, these pressures should be kept in this range. And if the pressure is going high, there is a chance that, particularly if the transmembrane begins, that means keep pre-membrane pressure and post-membrane pressure. Difference between pre and post post-membrane pressure is higher, and pre-membrane pressure is less than 300, but the gradient is high. That means that there is some problem in the oxygenator and you should think that oxygenator has to be changed. Otherwise, the patient will have some problem. So these pressures should be monitored and we are continuously monitoring these pressure in ECMO patient. And they are the most vital part of ECMO uh, therapy. And this is the work of a perfusionist or the nursing staff who is looking after to monitor the pre-membrane and the post-membrane pressure and keep the gradient less than 50. 
Now, what are the other things we need to observe is the related to the patient, the temperature, the CVP, the MAP, hematuria, because there is high chance of hemolysis, circulation, the limb temperature, uh, the arterial, uh, the limb color, pulses, the capillary refill, the neuro observation, the pain assessment and the ventilator. These are the routine management and assessment of the ventilator of the ECMO patients. The direct the circuit is, is there any leak of the circuit oozing or the kinking of the circuit? Is there any jerk on shake in the circuit? It indicates problem with the preload. Is there any problem with the dressing, post, pre, and post membrane pressure, oxygen flow, and oxygenator? And, and also, these three parameters, which actually uh, uh, one is this is SVO2 and the lactate. This indicates the global perfusion state and the post oxygenator PO2. That means uh, the capacity of oxygenator to achieve a particular PO2 is important to monitor in ECMO patients. So these are the parameters which are mandatory to monitor in ECMO patients. Now you have put the patient on ECMO. Now you are monitoring the patient on ECMO. The third question or clinical question comes when you can say that your patient is improving. When you say that, okay, my patient uh, is on the path of recovery. So it is very simple. One, to assess the end organ function. This is the lactate and the uh, SBO2. S, uh, uh, which, uh, we can see the central vein oxygen saturation. If these are improving, that means your patient perfusion, your patient oxygen is improving. Then you can assess the cardiopulmonary function. You can see the contractility of the heart in the echo. You can see the pulsatile flow in the arterial waveform. You can see the mean artery pressure. You can see the end tidal CO2. You can see the gas exchange. You can see the lung mechanics. These are the factors which you assess to see whether a patient is improving or not. And also you can see the neurological recovery because these patients are high chance of bleeding, sometimes high chance of uh, uh, ECMO related neurological issues. Now, once you find that your patient has improved, there are certain criteria which whether if the patient is fulfilling, you can go for a weaning trial. If the patient's heart rate is settled around 130, the systolic blood pressure is more than 90, a map of 70, minimal vessel support, central venous pressure less than 12, urine output maintaining good tissue perfusion, and if a 2 day echo ejection pattern is more than 40%, actually it is in the VA ECMO, and the patient has less pH, primary arterial hypertension, these patients are fulfilling some of the criteria for the patient who is uh, uh, VA ECMO or VV ECMO. In particular, when we put the patient on VA ECMO, there are certain important criteria like if you have decreased the pump flow to 0.5 to 1 liter per minute. Remember, it cannot be a prolonged decrease, very short period of time, whether you can decrease the flow with maintaining anticoagulation. And if you look at the hemodynamics, particularly if the MAP is maintained for more than 65, if the pulse pressure is 30, and echocardiography if the ejection fraction is more than 25%, and patients' aortic VTI more than 10 will have positive flow, these patients will might fulfilling the criteria for the uh, weaning from the VA ECMO. Weaning from the VV ECMO is simple. It is just you maintain the uh, ECMO flow rate and you stop the blender. That means if you have stopped the oxygen supply and your patient is maintaining the oxygenation with the conventional ventilation with increasing the FiO2 or demand of the patient, and if this is maintained for six hours a stable period, you can think to decandidate the patient and wean the patient from VV ECMO. So the VV ECMO weaning is relatively uh, similar from the V ECMO in comparison to the V ECMO patient. This is how to decannulate. I'm not going in detail to how to decannulate, but simply if you have put a percutaneous decannulation, a percutaneous cannulation, the decannulation is very simple. You could just remove the cannula, put a suture, and put a pressure dressing there. 
but if it is surgically placed that you have to call the surgeon and then he will he will repair the cell from where the cannula is placed so surgically placed we cannot remove percutaneously we have to remove surgically and percutaneous placed we we can just move it and put a dressing now this is the important question we are talking about a complex uh, uh, treatment we are talking about treatment who has got a high chance of complications but the question is whether it is working or not whether it's working in a situation of impact on the mortality or not so this is important question now it can be the history of the ECMO. the first successful ECMO was in a trauma patient 1971 and it was put on 6 hours in the membrane ECMO and this patient survived the adult first adult ECMO in 1961 Again, Robert Bartley, who is called the father of the ECMO, was the first person who actually uh, uh, reported a neonatal survival. This baby, who is uh, who has a meconium aspiration, and he was he was put on the ECMO, and 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 uh, see, actually uh, now uh, almost around thirty five years, and how he survived, and this is credit to first neonatal ECMO survival, nineteen. 75 1975 by robert bartley so this is how the neonatal survival on ecmo the meconium aspiration ard is present now in the past uh, uh, 1979 the mars trial this is very very discussed trial and they found that there is no survival benefit in putting the patient in ecmo and actually they found that there are only 10% patient to survive on the ecmo and there are a lot of criticism lot of discussion about this and actually this cause this stop of the ecmo program and not to this and that program uh, because of the high mortality in ecmo patient but these trials have little relevance now with this because a lot of changes has occurred in the ecmo and the current ecmo is uh, miniature ecmo less complications less apparent requirement less bleeding so if we talk about the seizure trial which was done in uh, uh, 2009 i believe 2009 was published and this is that will be the first trial which is done for the benefit in ecmo patients and these trials show that if the patient who has got a severe ards and the patient is transferred to the ecmo center and they have a better chance of survival and they uh, in comparison to the conventional ventilation and actually this is the trial which opened the door for the ecmo first to the same year we have a h1n1 pandemic and uh, the most important part of h1n1 is the severe ards and the registry data and those who did the meta analysis have found the patient of severe ards in fact they have hypoxemia with h1n1 treated with ecmo has better survival so this happens in 2009 eolia trial which is the most debated trial and uh, uh, one of the important landmark trial from the ecmo they based on the seizure trial and the h1n1 they formulated that okay if we can treat a patient of ards severe ards early with the ecmo is the survival benefit and they found that the eolia trial provides inconclusive support for the benefit of ecmo in severe ards so there is no clear cut support and in the favor of ecmo they found that the early initiation of ecmo did not improve 60 day mortality and in comparison to the standard care of care in these patients this is the first observation but however the data suggested that is the possible clinical benefit from ecmo over a standard of care especially if used early rather than late so this half glass full and empty situation they only has provided in conclusive but those center uh, who are doing it still they are doing it for a uh, patient who has got a severe ards and they also uh, the authors of the eolia researchers uh, has has recommended a standard therapy including prone and neuromuscular had a high rate of failure requiring rescue ecmo so here i want to clarify that many patients of eolia trial which were in the conventional treatment actually cross to the ecmo so they are on the conventional treatment and they are they actually received ecmo because of their condition deteriorated 
so this 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 recommendation came from these authors that if you are treating there is high chance of failure in refractory hypoxemia and these patients can be treated with that apne liya na again also registry data which is the most important uh, uh, registry site for the ecmo those who are doing the ecmo they are registering their patients to the also and they have found that there is a, there is a precipitous increase in the ecmo the 31300 patients of respect support 18000 correct support and 5100 patients with extra carpool so day by day the number of patients who are receiving the ecmo are increasing that means ecmo is uh, actually getting more popular in such situations you then getting the uh uh what are the what are the implications mass lag resistance and challenges for the ecmo the conditions that are known to be associated with poor prognosis and inability to anticoagulate are the contraindication we have already discussed in detail the major complication for ecmo related to heparin and the thrombosis limb ischemia infections these are the major complications although there are other uh, uh, other problems we can say the problems not the complication like hypoxia hypox and uh, north pole syndrome north south syndrome and so many harlequin syndrome but these can be managed here is the limiting factors for the uh, maintenance of ecmo and this is the most important indian scenario where the patient has to pay from their pocket and if the patient is in ecmo which is a high cost treatment high end treatment and you should must think that it is an ethical obligation to consider the risk and benefit very carefully when considering ecmo in patient and treatment plan for example if a patient has got cld or acute liver failure or cld patient who is going to ards probably they are not the candidate for ecmo because ultimately outcome depends upon the liver transplant not on the ecmo treatment so very carefully and ethically we have to consider who are the patient who can be benefited from providing the ecmo to such situation so with this i'll thank to everybody for their patience listening and uh, i'll thank again to dr tapesh for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about ecmo thank you everybody and thank you dr jitendra also uh thank you sir uh, very uh, nice and uh, lucid presentation and uh, covering everything right from the circuit to the calculation to the physiology and to the va vv uh, before we take the questions from everybody sir just two things i would like uh, to uh, you know uh, clarify for everybody one is like what is the average cost uh, for ecmo for a ards patient you know who comes out in a week 10 days whatever and second what is your real experience with infection on ecmo because that is a problem i think yeah uh, if we if we talk about the cost of the initiation of ecmo will be costing around 4 to 5 lakhs per patient because they have to charge the cannula they have to charge the circuit and the circuit itself causes around 1.5 to 2 lakhs and the cannulation so initiation itself causes around 4 to 5 lakhs uh, in gangram hospital and then a per day cost uh, is uh, 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 almost around uh, 30 to 40000 extra whatever is required in the icu cost plus 40 to 50000 extra in uh, ecmo patients so it is almost around 1.5 lakhs 1 lakh to 1.5 lakhs per day in intensive care unit coming to your second question the infection rate for ecmo if, if you go through the western data the infection rate they have what they have claimed is low in ecmo cases because infection rate uh, ecmo has nothing to do with infection because the flow rate is very high indian scenario we have find all sorts of infection in ecmo cases we have found the fungal infection we have found the because it is all uh, uh, our our uh, uh, the blood stream infections are more common uh, in these patients so we have found a high incidence of ecmo infection in ecmo cases thank you sir uh, the house is open to questions please you can ask your questions preferably otherwise you can put it in the chat box so uh dr vinod very nicely covered this so much complex topic and one can imagine uh, 
uh, is running a fellowship which is having a one year course and he covered all these things in a mm. almost a year, one hour <laughs> so that is yeah. uh, one of the important thing of course one of the important thing uh, especially uh, on the ecmo is the all our drugs needs to be a uh, redosing that's yes. that's very mm. important point so of course that is very complex so this things cannot be covered each and every drug is having their own behavior on the ecmo depending upon the situation that that's one of the uh, major yeah. and sometime ecmo combined with the crrt then again CRT. these things are so most of the drug requires higher dose rather than increasing the dose yes yeah. okay dr jayar any further comments before i put the questions yeah continue Okay, sir. Question number one is uh, uh, they, they want to thank you, lovely presentation. And then the question is from Dr. Sopna, sir. Uh, VV ECMO specifically used when respiratory support is required. So why is ventilation required? See, uh, VV ECMO is used when respiratory support is required because uh, if you will not. To use a minimal ventilation, then there is uh, there is a high chance that your patient is both lung is get to collapse, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, if the lungs are getting collapsed, the lung recovery is less. So two situations, Doctor Tapesh. One is that if the patient is uh, having a VV ECMO and the patient is a uh, patient for the transplant. Uh, like COPD patient or emphysema patient, we can we there is no need to use any ventilation. These patients can be gas exchange can be maintained if the with the ECMO and there is no need to put the patient on ventilator. But contrary to this, in ARDS patient, when you put the patient on ECMO, there is a high chance that the lung is getting collapsed and lung will not recover unless we do some lung palliation, some lung suctioning, and some. type of pp given with the ultra protective ventilation does that answer your question dr sapna yes sir sir okay yes, sir. so then another question from then dr. second uh, relevant to this relevant to this is uh, special in the vv ecmo don't try to normalize the gas exchange by the change in the ventilator setting that ventilation is purely doctor vinod already told you to prevent the atrial ectotrauma and that's not a pure, purely for the ventilation yes. so we use the ventilator just to keep the lung inflated so that no further injury happens all the gas exchange should be maintained with the uh, adjustment of the ecmo flow and sweep sweep flow or maybe uh, checking your oxygenation aging is there or not these are the important things okay next not the ventilator person yes we can next, next question from dr bhagya sir role of ecmo in post cardiac arrest patient Yeah, the, uh, the role of patient uh, post cardiac arrest patient is that uh, if your patient has a witness arrest number 1 and the patient has got a reversible disease like mi and the patient has sustained uh, some vt or v and third is that if the patient has got uh, uh, the the conventional cpr is not working then we can put the patient on ecmo the ecmo will maintain the circulation meanwhile you can do your definitive procedure to either to do a pcai or you can have a some form of th definitive therapy for the heart is that okay doctor bhagya you can unmute yourself please dr bhagya clear ecmo role in post cardiac arrest patient yes sir yes sir okay so the other question sir following the vv ecmo is used uh, then why uh, ventilation she wants to know please explain gas flow and blood flow ratio yeah see uh, uh, there are two things in gas flow and blood flow ratio uh uh we start with 1 to 1 ratio that means ki uh, if you have a blood flow of 4 liter you should start a gas flow of 4 liter with a fio2 of 1 and then you should see how the cr is clearance important thing is that
in ARDS patient, many patients who are on ECMO, they will have a hypercardia initially. So our aim is not to bring down hypercardia to normocardia or hypocardia very fast. I, I, otherwise, this patient will have problems. So you start with one is to one ratio, look at the CO2, and accordingly you can titrate it goes to two is to one or three is to one, depending upon how much CO2 you want to collect. So starting is uh, minimum is one is to one ratio, and then you can titrate it according to the carbon dioxide. Okay. Find out the Sopna? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Dr. Nilanjan, you want to ask something? Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm uh, uh, yeah. I'm really blessed to be uh, Dr. Vinod's uh, former student. So, <laughs> actually, I wanted to ask you, sir, uh, that uh, can you could you please explain about Harlequin syndrome? What exactly the concept about Harlequin syndrome is? See, Harlequin syndrome I have not covered because it is the initial lecture of the ECMO. So, we have not covered the complex situation. Harlequin syndrome occurs in a patient who has got a VA ECMO. Okay. Yes, sir. And in a VA ECMO patient, if your uh, heart started functioning better, then more and more deoxygenated blood is going to the upper part of the body. And so that your upper part of the body is getting less oxygenated. And the lower part, because you have a femoral, your, see, the femoral circulation is the oxygenated blood, which is going in the lower part of the body. Okay. Yes, and, yes. and initially, your heart was not functioning. So this blood can go into the aorta also. Okay, so mixing somewhere occurs in the lower aorta, but but if you have a better cardiac function, then yeah. gradually the heart is getting more and more uh, uh, more and more function. And if this situation, if the lung is not working, then the more and more deoxygenated blood is going to the upper part of the body, and this is called uh, this can cause a, a Harlequin syndrome. So this is uh, how we can explain the Harlequin syndrome and the treatment for Harlequin syndrome is that you have to just reduce the ECMO flow and increase the FI flow of the ventilator that will improve the uh, function. Or you can, you can change the uh, uh, patient to even from VA to VV ECMO. Okay, so just uh, decreasing the FI flow is the treatment. Uh, uh -huh. And third is you can you can stop uh, 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 the uh, uh, placement in the femoral artery. You choose the axillary artery. Okay. So there are many 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 options to manage the uh, Harlequin syndrome. But best way is to uh, manage with improving the in, increasing the FI artery. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Sir, next is about cannulation. Please tell something about uh, extra cannula for limb ischemia, way to connect. And if using dual lumen cannula, any specific change in gas and blood flow? See, if, if you are using a, uh, uh, if you are using a uh, uh, VA ECMO and the perfusion cannula, extra cannula for perfusion cannula should be placed in the femoral artery. And uh, usually the femoral artery, but uh, if you have a problem, you can even go below in the popliteal artery. It's also, you can put, but it is very easy to place in the femoral artery while you are cannulating things. Okay, and this provides the oxygenated blood to the femoral artery distal to the your uh, cannula. So this is called distal perfusion. And we have to maintain the distal perfusion. It is ruled that whatever the size of cannula you are using, even small or large, you have to maintain a distal perfusion, and you have to you have to place a distal perfusion cannula. The second question I was sir, uh, if using a dual lumen cannula, any specific change in gas and blood flow? There is no no specific change in the gas and blood flow in the dual lumen cannula. Only thing is that the dual lumen cannula, avalon catheter. We are talking about avalon catheter, no? dual lumen cannula. So this has to be in the uh, the drainage side is from the IVC and the SVC, and the reperfusion oxygenated blood should go into the tricuspid valve area and the RA. So there is there is no any change in the blood flow or gas flow area. It has got a limiting blood flow. It cannot in go a blood flow of more than five liters. 
if you think that your blood flow is requirement is more than five liters, sometimes in ARDS patient for oxygenation, then you should avoid dual cannula in ARDS patient. Better to put a double cannula for a VV ECMO type of femoral and the joint. And uh, also, dual lumen is actually costly. Also, I have to. Uh, yeah, it is costly. Yeah, it is quite costly. And sure, cost level in India. Yeah, and uh, it is also not. Okay, sir. And what is treatment of large pulmonary air leaks while on ECMO? I read. I read that the vent needs to be turned off for hours or days. Is it true? Please clarify. Yeah, uh, I tell you the problem is that. If you have a pulmonary leak and if the patient is not on ECMO, you have only one option to put a test tube. There's no any other option to treat such type of patient. Fortunately, if the patient is on ECMO, then the patient is on heparin also. If you try to put test tube in each patient, there is high chance that the patient is bleeding. The best way to manage is that to decrease the ventilator setting, to go for minimal ventilator setting, you can even decrease the PEEP to zero and let it heal for one or two, uh, one week. And that way we can manage a large pulmonary leak in such patients. That, but yes, if you are trying to wean the patient, then you have to see whether the leak has settled down or not. So there is no urgency for the placement of chest tube in the ECMO patient if the patient has got a pneumothorax. It is not going to have hemodynamic effect on the lung because the ventilator setting is very low. Is that okay, Dr. Sir? And uh, any further questions? Any? Okay, one more question, sir. Uh, can you please talk a little about CRT with ECMO? Yeah, we, uh, many patients on ECMO who is on ARDS land up in the multi organ failure, and these patients also require management of the AKI by CRT. So, uh, CRT placement is very easy on ECMO. You just have to put a pre pump, uh, uh, both uh, uh, that means the connection, drainage, and supply should be placed on the pre pump. Only precaution, nothing should be done post. Oxygenator. This is the most important thing because post -ox oxygenator blood is going directly to the vein or the artery. So you can do every fiddling, either pre pump or pre oxygenator. The post oxygenator should be clearly uh, uh, not pre touched. So the CRT machine can be put either a pre pump or the pre oxygenator and can be do a usual CRT. So there are people who are also putting a CRT catheter and they are keeping CRT separate from the extracorporeal circulation, that is also acceptable. Okay, sir, next question. Uh, is that okay, Dr. Adul? Hello, Dr. Adul? Okay, next question, role of proning in ECMO, sir. Role of? Proning. Proning, prone ventilation on ECMO. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, no. This is this is uh, uh, one of the one of the issues that whether you should prone the patient on ECMO. The rational for proning is that we know that if you prone the patient, the lung injury chances are minimal and the lung recovery is better. There are certain conditions where the patient has been prone on the ECMO. And but mostly in the trial conditions, like even in the Yolia trial, there are patients who has been prone on the ECMO, and uh, the, you can prone the patient on ECMO. Uh, there is a high risk of complications while proning. There is a chance that the patient might have a catheter uh, dislodgement. That is the only problem. Otherwise, ECMO flow, ECMO machine, lung and ventilation, everything is safe. There is no. Problem in putting the patient on ECMO. If you have a manpower, you can pay upon the patient on ECMO. Uh, any other questions? You can directly ask or you can type. So I think that is sort of answered all the. Just to, just to share, uh, presently yes. we are having a kid. Post COVID, severe myocardial dysfunction is on the VA ECMO. Today is the day four. 
Yeah. For yeah. Him now, now we are uh, seeing a contract rate improvement is a almost three year old child. Post COVID, so we are uh, myocardial yes. function is on the. So the yeah, they are the people who have got the high chance of recovery after this end. Uh, yeah, especially uh, yes. yes. the other people because, young because age. See, people are asking about people are telling about the post COVID fibrosis and other things. We have seen that uh, uh, putting the patient for ECMO and internal vaccine exchange for. Ten days, fifteen days to three weeks, the lung is recovering in those patients. We have seen uh, people. Yes. So uh, one or two things. Uh, one is about the role of VEGMO and aluminium phosphide poisoning. I think it is very relevant. See, uh, the maximum paper of VEGMO uh, is for India is on the aluminium phosphide poisoning. If you talk about the poisoning, and Dr. Vivek is from Ludhiana. Who is who has actually started and given the ball to a new type of treatment? Was the first person who has started a, a VFMO aluminium, and he has shown that the patient survived. And this is the treatment which has got a huge impact on the mortality. Yeah. We know that if you treat the patient early with VFMO, then the first part poisoning, the patient can improve and we go out home without any problem. So that is for everybody. That is to highlight for everybody because all of you are coming from different setups, and especially those who are catering to rural population, because sulfur poisoning continues to be very common. And with ECMO, yes, highly treatable, not hundred percent, but very good results. So if you have technically, this is the one of the indication for ECMO is the potentially condition is reversible. You just yeah. need to support for a few days. So. So this is rather than advanced ILD and the considering the ECMO, these are the more. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is uh, about, sir, I want to ask you, what are you using uh, in sepsis apart from ARS? If there is, you know, hypotension, shock not dissolving with, uh, you know, in any setting like that, you are using. No, ARS, we know sepsis. We are not using sepsis. No, no, we are not using sepsis. Sepsis and multi-organ failure, we are not using ECMO. Because uh, uh, see, once the multi-organ failure has set in and the liver function is deranged and the functions are deranged, uh, uh, actually in our hospital, pediatric people are using with a very little bit of uh, impact on the mortality, and we have not used in uh, sepsis and septic shock patient unless the predominant component is myocardial depression. Yes, so uh, I like like the physiology also should help in uh, if there is a myocardial depression and the blood pressure is not picking up, then I think it should help. Like this, this. Yes, that that is the only situation where yes. you can go if the usually in sepsis the septic shock the cardiac function is cardiac output is high, but in, in early part if there is still the myocardial depression, then you can uh, uh, we are using in such situations. Yes, yes. And uh, of course, you can use a uh, you know hybrid kind of a uh, also the ARDS with myocardial dysfunction, blood pressure not picking up. Yes, yeah, uh, I, I have not touched this because we can still use the. No, we will. I think we will need to have a second session. ECMO can be. We will have a second session after some time on further VA ECMO details, etc., etc., sir. I think that will be required. This was the basics. Yeah, you can have it. You can have it. It's, uh, yes. Yes, after some time, we'll have a second session which can go on to details of VA ECMO, etc., etc. So I think that was wonderful. And yes. I think there's a question here, another question uh, from Dr. Sapna. If VA ECMO is for cardiac support for a failing heart, what is the use of putting input cannula into femoral artery? See, uh, the, if, if it is. It, it, you have to maintain the cardiac output. Okay, so if you put a cardiac in the femoral artery, if you put it up in the femoral artery, if you put the, the oxygenated blood goes from femoral artery to the internal iliac artery, and it can go up to the aorta because the blood is not coming from the heart. A cardiac output is very low, so the blood is not coming from the heart. There is no any resistance from femoral artery is going to the aorta. And from there, it can be recirculated in the whole body. It can go up to the upper limb and up to the brain. That's why uh, it is used. But once the heart starts functioning, then the cannula and the femoral artery 
might be not working and that is the cause of harlequin syndrome if the lung is not good i think i've answered the question i think the server has answered all the questions in depth and everybody should be satisfied i think any more questions a wonderful session as sir sir the number of questions is you know it's showing the interest and the depth of uh, the yes. the session excellent and actually you know sir thank you important thing and you know life saving thing you can really do wonders <laughs> yes chalo sir i think any other questions guys or should we close it two minutes i am waiting ha huh? dr jitendra please add your from your side if you want to Uh, give some finishing comments yeah i think not i need a comment from dr jitendra as he is also doing the things sir please add something from your experience uh, anything you want to share uh, see of course it is a, a great team work uh, doing that more, more and more you do the more and more you learn the things these are the uh, uh, dr vinod very nicely covered the principle of uh, all the both the vb and va but of course the person who are doing as a team they need to work hard and they need to take care of each and every part of her previously the death rate was high because of the ecmo only because lot of safety related issues now we are having a a more understanding that's why we are not able to see the clear cut evidences in terms of the literature what we are having with this book correctly mentioned now the things the the most of the things before uh, maybe a 10 year 20 years back is related to the technique related mortalities and that actually uh, confound the uh, with or without that more now it becomes a uh, more and more standard of care in terms of um, certain situation and more and more experience makes the uh things less complication and uh, uh, everything will be able to everybody is able to deal the complication and that what practically affect the outcome that's the key uh, i am sure dr vinod is agreeing yes, with really yes. require team dedicated team and kind of and and a very dedicated team should be there because around the clock yes. you need to ensure the safety mm-hmm. dedication is the key to the icu success that is all there is Or 24 hours. More relevant in the act. Yes, sir. Everything is that is 24. 24 hours. Whatever happens, then 24 into 7 dedication is the key to success. Or oh, there is nothing else. 24 into. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It should work 24 into 7 and 24 into <laughs> guidance and expert monitoring. That's all. I think that is the key. <laughs> anyway, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. And uh, sir, who case is there? Thank you, thank you. No, no, no. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Vinod, sir. Very nice thank, word. Thanks, sir. Everybody, thanks for your patience. Okay. Okay, sir. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye, bye, Doctor Jinder. Thank you bye. so much. Okay, 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 Alta. Okay, guys. Thank you. Okay.